Well, thanks for joining us again. Last time I explained that we're going to begin a series of messages this fall called Questions Larry Asked. Uh, they're questions that were inspired by Larry Gannon, but we decided to ask everybody, what questions would you like us to address in some sermons? And so people have been responding to that ever since, and I'm looking at the future preaching, preaching calendar to make um, plans to answer those questions. You know the first question that was asked me, though? The first question that was asked me was essentially, would you talk about the interaction of church and state? How should our faith influence our politics? Should it influence at all? Where, where are the limitations? Where does thing, one begin and the other end? All that kind of, really a, a, a good question to ask, significant question to ask, because there are people on all kinds of the spectrum that are Christian, or at least call themselves Christian. On the one hand, there are those who would say, oh yes, church and state need to be mixed because we need to save America. You know, there are some Christians that say, you know, we need to save America by getting the church more and, and, and religion more involved in, in government. On the other hand, there's an extreme that says, you know, religion's okay, but politics and religion, oil and water, if you want to have your religious beliefs, your church stuff, that's okay. Keep it in the church building. It's a personal thing. Just don't let it influence your and don't try to to share with me your religious views to influence politics or government. And so there are people that really so, and a lot of people are right are right there in the middle. But we're kind of wondering where should we stand and and why. More importantly, and what does the Bible say? I probably should say at the outset, I am talking about these things not as a political scientist. Never took a political science course. I'm not talking about these things as a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. And aren't you glad? I'm a pastor, teacher. And my responsibility is to teach the scripture so that we can have the mind of Christ in fact, love demands it, doesn't it? When Jesus gave us the greatest commandment, what did he say? The first is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Thinking like Christ is essential to loving as Christ loved. There's some who don't take the mind and thinking stuff that seriously, I suppose. Well, I, I, love is about a feeling, you know, it's not necessarily about, no, 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 no. We def, how we define love is what God teaches us. And that is why we have to love God with all of our mind. That's why Peter would write in 2 Peter chapter 3, that this was the reason that he wrote his letters. He said, dear friends, this is now my second letter that I have written to you. In both letters, I want to stir up your sincere understanding by way of reminder. Peter says, I've written both of my letters to stir up some righteous thinking in you because you can't love God and people unless you're thinking right thoughts. It's why C.S. Lewis, the great writer said one time, good philosophy must exist if for no other reason, because bad philosophy needs to be answered. We need to be able to think like Christ, to have knowledge and reasoning that is led by scripture, which reveals to us the mind of God. See, we are constantly exposed to bad thinking. We're constantly being bombarded with non-biblical ideas, assumptions, conclusions, phraseology, phrases. And if we are going to love as Christ loved, then we have to think, we have to be able to discern what's righteous, what's not righteous, what's godly, what's not godly. I think one of the, this is one of the greatest challenges of ministry that I face today 
It's cultural Christianity, in a word. Cultural Christianity is, is people who are Christians who think more like the culture than like Christ. People who just have absorbed cultural assumptions and conclusions, and then they conform those conclusions to what the Bible says. Rather than the Bible transforming us, our cultural assumptions transform how we interpret the Bible. That's why it's so important. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, So do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind, so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. You know what it means to love? It means to be able to discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Anything imperfect is not love. See, the biblical mandate for us is to discern. Now, self-willed people won't take that seriously. They don't concern themselves with God's perfect will. They'll accept generally somewhere on the target, you know, somewhere, maybe it's close or not, but at least it feels good. For them, the psalmist writes, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The foolish thinking person is the one whose primary purpose is not to discern and follow the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. It's just to do what they generally feel is right, to allow themselves lazily to conform to the sloppy thinking of this world, and then not to love in, with God's love. The wise person says, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me down right paths, paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And I want the name of God to be glorified. And so I want to know the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God so that I can love God with all my heart and soul and mind. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 32, therefore says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. See, the person who is able to discern the good, pleasing, perfect will of God, not only is able to love God and other people, because they're following God's right ways, they also position themselves to be underneath God's blessing. And people who are not discerning the good, pleasing, perfect will of God place themselves out from underneath God's blessing. And it's true. what's true of individuals is true of nations. Every nation will either live under God's blessing or outside God's blessing. Now, that's not to say that God's not going to bless nations that are not following him or honoring him. In his grace, he does. But we position ourselves for his blessing when we understand his good, pleasing, and perfect will, because not only does his face shine on us, but pragmatically, we are living in a way that is consistent with how God has created the universe to work. And to be under his blessing is to live consistently with reality. Every generation, the early generations in the United States understood this. It's really impressive when you read uh, United States history. Um, for 150 years, easily, over and over and over again, because people had a more godly mindset, they would often look at things that were and say, that's the providence of God. Look at how God is, pro only God could do that. People looked at the, how, how George Washington was able to survive miraculously in so many different battles. And they, you know, God provided, God lifted him up. It's what caused Abraham Lincoln to observe that America is not, is not God's chosen people, but it seems, he says, we are God's almost chosen people. Here's the quote. 
He said, I shall be most happy indeed if I shall be an humble servant, a humble instrument in the hands of the Almighty. See, Lincoln's whole purpose was, I want to be following God's will so I can be in the hands of the Almighty, under his blessing. And of this, the, the um, quote continues, his almost chosen people for perpetuating the object of that great struggle. Lincoln understood his responsibility as a leader was to place himself in a position to be used for God's blessing. Um, yes, Lincoln, when he was younger, was not as um, godly-minded or biblically uh, committed, but as he grew older, and certainly in his presidency, all of that changed. By the way, this is also the reason why Jewish people, when they fled persecution in Europe, saw the United States as God's provided refuge for them. They, In fact, there's a famous portrait that shows somebody has uh, uh, painted that shows Uncle Sam uh, standing over what looks like a miraculous dividing of the Red Sea as the Jewish people walk across into the promised land as though God was providentially providing refuge in the United States for Jewish refugees fleeing persecution. So our question in this series, at least one of the questions is, how can we be under God's blessing, following God's right ways, while still at the same time having a healthy separation of church and state? I want to suggest to you in this series that we can only place ourselves under God's blessing if we observe God's separation of church and and state, that that's by God's design, not ours. After all, it's like the old hymn says, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. The key for us to be happy as individuals and as a nation is to learn what it means to trust and obey God in his, under his authority, like we talked, at, uh, talked last time, and therefore underneath his following, his order in society. Now, the key to understanding church-state separation or the relationship between the pulpit and politics is to understand three things, purpose, principle, and power for each. Let's begin by saying God designed the church and state to be separate, but at the highest level, he actually gave them the same ultimate purpose. The purpose of the church and the purpose of the state, the purpose of everything under creation is to bring God glory. Remember the old doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Everything exists to praise God. Not because God is somehow needy, but it's because of God's character. God is worthy of all that is created, worshiping him, all creatures here below. I love that picture, by the way, of all creatures praising God. You ever think about that? That means like every bird and every horse and every worm and every mountain and every star and every blade of grass Everything exists to praise God. All creatures here below praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. God is great. His greatness is worthy of praise. But the immediate question you're asking is, how do all creatures here below praise God? It has been quite some time since I've seen a worm worship service, you know, since where the worm congregation gets together to sing their songs. It's been a while since I've seen the mountains getting together to sing, you know, praise worship to God. Everything, here's the thing, everything here below praises God by functioning according to the purpose for which he created it. Why we need to be clear on the purpose of the church and the purpose of the state is 
the way the church and the and the state worship God and bring him praise is to functioning is to function according to the purpose for which they were created. That's how God is honored. The church and the government both honor God by doing God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. God created the church, however, for one purpose that ultimately gives him praise. And God created the government for another purpose that ultimately gives him praise when the government functions in that way. This is significant for those who are followers of Jesus Christ because this is where thinking often gets sloppy. This is where people go off in different political directions that I would suggest dishonors God because we are getting away from God's purpose for government or for the church. Okay, so what are the distinct purposes, the separate purposes of church and state? Join us next time. That's where we're going to get into the meat and potatoes of that. And then the time after that, we're going to talk about assumptions and misconceptions in more even greater detail than that. But for now, hope to see you next time. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, that you have called us for your purpose, that you have given us clear purpose, that you uh, have shown us in your word how You've showed us your, the order that you have put in your creation, the order of the home, the order of the family, the order of church, the order of the state. Help us, Lord, uh, I guess as followers of you, to want our minds to be completely in love with doing your will because we love you and want to praise you. I pray that you would transform our minds from the influences of a culture that is influenced by the satanic, and we would instead be transformed to Christ. By your power, we pray these things through Christ. Amen. Well, how's that for a cliffhanger? Hope to see you next time.